Hey everybody, welcome back to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we're gonna to be looking at a great viewer question about grounding when batteries are involved, and specifically grounding in mixed signal systems where you might need isolation. Now, sometimes you may have a battery-powered device. That battery-powered device may be powering some sensors, and those sensors may need to sense some signal from some other analog device that you're interfacing with. So how do you do that and how do you ground it? That's what we're gonna talk about in this video. Let's get started. So before we get started talking about battery power and grounding in battery powered systems, let's take a look at that viewer question. Gabenga writes, Hi, very insightful video indeed. How about if your system is purely battery powered and there is no other power source around? There are analog inputs from a field device. Does this require isolation? Well, like most great questions in PCB design, the answer is it depends. So let's take a look at a few different ways that you could set up your system so that you could capture these low level signals from some other device that's in the field. So first, let's take a look at a typical topology involving a battery powered device. So obviously your power source is going to be your battery. That battery is then going to connect to your devices. And this node here, we're just gonna call it a ground, GND. Here, you're going to then connect to some device over here. Let's just call it, for example, an MCU. But of course, you are probably aware that an MCU cannot just run straight off of battery power. And the main reason for that is because the battery might put out too much power for your particular MCU. So typically you're going to have some sort of regulator here. The regulator that you actually need to power your MCU is gonna depend on the output voltage of the battery. And then typically you're wrapping this all back to ground with the same node here. So this is all on the same net. So if you're on a PCB, this could be routed, but best practice, of course, with a digital component like an MCU is to use a power plane. The regulator and the battery need to match up. And I bring up the regulator because the regulator is an important source of noise. And one of the reasons that you might try to isolate an analog signal coming into your MCU, let's just name it AN, that signal might need to be isolated from everything over here in order to prevent noise from the regulator from reaching this analog signal and then interfering with your measurement at the MCU. So which type of regulator do you need to pair up with your battery so that you can power your MCU and your other digital components? Well, it really depends on the type of battery. Just as an example, a lot of devices will use these lithium polymer pouch batteries. They output at 3.7 volts. You can also find lithium ion batteries that come in a traditional cylindrical format, and then you can stack those to get the higher voltages if you need. With a lithium polymer battery, they tend to just plug in straight away and you can't really put them in series, although you could put them in parallel. So if you're dealing with something like the lithium polymer pouch battery, that's going to have an output voltage of 3.7 volts. Um, if you can find a way to stack these so that they're in series, you can get this voltage higher. And then in that case, you're going to need a regulator that steps down to the logic level required in this MCU. So typically for an MCU, this is going to be 3.3 volts or it could be five volts. Now, if you need to just step this down to 3.3 volts and then regulate it at that level, you can go ahead and use an LDO, and that's gonna get you down to 3.3 volts. Now, if you need to step this up to five volts, you would then need to use a boost converter, and a boost converter is then gonna allow you to get up to five volts or even higher. These two different converters have different noise profiles, and there could be other signals on the board or other components on the board that also create noise that could interfere with this analog signal. And so that gets down to the crux of why you might want to isolate this type of analog signal. You want to protect that analog signal from the noise that could be produced from, for example, this boost converter, or it could be a buck boost converter if you need to also step down to lower voltages, or you might need to isolate this analog line from other digital signals that are elsewhere on the board that are being created by other digital components. So your job is to determine whether or not you need isolation in order to protect this signal from all of these different noise sources. Now, when this is a very low level signal, meaning low voltage, low current, you're gonna have a low signal to noise ratio. And if that signal to noise ratio is too low, it can be difficult to distinguish the signal you want to measure from all of the noise that's being generated by, for example, a boost converter or by other digital components that are on the board. So now that we know why we might need to apply isolation to this type of analog signal, 
Let's look at how we can actually do that using some basic components. So now what we want to do is look at the system level, how we might be able to isolate that input analog signal from all of this stuff. And then I'll show a brief example in Altium Designer using our isolated ADC project that shows what this might look like on a circuit board. I mentioned isolated ADCs. That's one thing that you could use to try and get this type of signal and then pass it off to your MCU for measurement. So just as an example, we can use an isolated ADC. I'm gonna abbreviate this as I-ADC. And an isolated ADC has two grounds associated with it. I would have here the same ground that we have here that is used to reference our battery and our MCU. Then we're gonna have a digital interface here, usually I squared C or SPI. And then we have a second ground here, which I'm gonna call our analog ground. So this is the reference point that we use to measure this input analog signal that we want to measure here. The reason that we have here GND1, which is our system ground, and then AGND, this analog ground, is because we're trying to prevent any noise in the form of return currents from propagating over here into this analog signal that we want to measure. Here, we're powering this up on this side with our five volt input, or we could also have another regulator here, again, for example, like an LDO, and then that's gonna give this thing power. So when we have this separate ground here like this, we only have the return current for this signal existing in this portion of the ground region on the PCB. The rest of it is referenced to all of this portion of the ground region in this PCB. And then you're gonna have an isolation gap that's built into the component and then you reflect that same isolation gap into the PCB by splitting up these two ground regions. Now, the reason this works without creating a big EMI problem is because you're not taking this I2C or SPI stuff and routing it across this gap like this. You should not ever do that because that's what's gonna create a lot of radiation. Now, the other thing you shouldn't do is try to take this analog signal and route it across the gap like this because you're gonna have the same problem and you don't have the return current nicely confined into this A, G, and D region on this side of the PCB. So this is a perfectly acceptable way to gather these low level signals and then prevent the noise from this section of the board from getting into this section of the board where you need to have this analog signal be very quiet. So this is a type of approach that's taken with audio, it's taken with precision measurement applications, and it can be taken generally when you need to have galvanic isolation on one area of the system compared to another area of the system. So this is also implemented for safety. If for some reason this region of the board exists in a high voltage area, this region of the board is protected from all of that high voltage up to very high voltages. So that's another reason we might want to implement this isolation gap. Now, another way that you can do this without using a isolated ADC is you could still isolate that analog input. However, you could do this without that integrated circuit and you could instead use an optocoupler. So we've discussed optocouplers in other videos and essentially an optocoupler is a phototransistor and it will be referenced to ground usually with some like current limiting applied and this will be GND1. And you would then take a measurement of current flow or take a measurement of the voltage or just run this straight into the MCU uh, coming off of this side of the optocoupler. There are different ways to do it and you'll find a lot of reference designs out there that use optocouplers in this kind of way. Now we also have our isolation barrier here built into the optocoupler and then reflected onto the PCB. And that provides galvanic isolation up to very high values. And it isolates this analog ground side of our PCB. Now, when we have our analog input labeled AN here, we then basically have this coming into the optocoupler and then we have a photodiode built into this circuit. This is then usually also connected to current limiting and then that connects back to our analog ground. This analog input could also be used to drive this photodiode which then modulates the power going into uh, this phototransistor. And that could be used to basically toggle the voltage on one of these inputs, which is then measured with an ADC. Or it could be used to essentially pulse one of these inputs if it's just a simple GPIO. 
So this is a much simpler topology here because we basically just have our analog input coming directly into this and then driving this photodiode. However, you have to make sure that this analog input has enough power to drive this photodiode and then turn this phototransistor fully on so that you can modulate the voltage seen at the input pin of this MCU. So if your analog input signal is too low, you're not going to be able to use it in this application and you would need something like an isolated ADC. Now, it's also possible in either situation to take this analog input, run it through an amplifier. But if you're gonna run this analog input through an amplifier, then you need another voltage source over here that then connects to this amplifier. And then this amplifier would be referenced to your analog ground. So this is another option that you could use and this is typically done when you need to have some reasonably high gain applied to this analog input signal in order to get it within the measurement range of your measurement device. So this option can also be used with isolated ADCs. Typically not required with isolated ADCs, but it can be used with them. And again, it's just meant to bring the strength of that analog signal into the measurement range of that isolated ADC. So we've got two principal ways to do this. Optocoupler, isolated ADC. So if you're unsure what all of this looks like on a printed circuit board, let's hop into All Team Designer. I'm gonna show you an example from one of our other projects and you can see what those split grounds look like. And this particular project uses an isolated ADC to implement that isolation that we're seeing here. I'm inside Altium Designer right now, and you can very clearly see that this is our isolated ADC module example project. And here in this region of the board, you can see that there is a split in the ground regions for an isolated analog input, which we have here coming through this coax. We also have a five volt power source coming in to this input, and that is powering our isolated ADC, which we have right here. So this isolated ADC is from Texas Instruments. It works pretty simply. We have a digital output on the right side. We have a five volt power source that is connected to our five volt system ground here on the right side of the board. Here on the left side, you see that we have a pair of analog ground pins. We have our analog input, and then we have our power source, which exists on the left side of this board. This power source could be external, and it's generally not very high current. You could even get it from the other side of the board and then coupled over here to this side. And the point here is that you have to have this other power source in order to power up the analog interface on the left side of this component. Now, because we've split the ground like this, any of the return current from, for example, this analog line is only gonna exist in this region of the board where you can see my mouse. Now, the other way I've set this up is to have the digital output on this isolated ADC only routing over here to the right and over to this connector. So you can see where all of that is being routed. So we're not routing it back around because then we're gonna really eliminate any noise coupling from this digital output over here to this analog input. So through a little bit of smart routing and then splitting up the ground regions for this isolated ADC, you can really do a great job of preventing noise from this digital section, from them coupling over to this analog section and interfering with this low level signal. Now, if you wanna get access to this project, make sure to check out the link in the description. We have a link to our isolated ADC video where I go over how to design with these components as well as how to design this board. And you get to watch this board be designed on video. You'll also be able to access the project files so you can use them on your own projects. Thanks for watching this video, everybody. Keep sending us your comments and questions. We love getting your comments and questions. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, and last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.